he looks out across a polluted orange sky, stained by the cancerous, pulsing growths of the capillary towers. His eye line lowers, staring across what was once the ocean. If he strains his eyes, he can see the seabed writhing. The ocean eats itself, and soon it will writhe no longer. He wears the combat fatigues of the Zanak Tenth and the wounds of a dozen battles. Alien acid has made a blister of his face, an outstretched handprint of unmarked skin stamped across his right eye. The hand that made that print is gone, melted into sludge. He does not know why he is still alive. There is a las pistol in his remaining hand. If the sea was still there, he would have used it on himself. The ugliness has shocked him out of suicide. If he put the gun to his temple and pulled the trigger, his body would not disappear into churning grey waves. Instead it would splatter, one last depressing punchline, and be devoured by those things that have replaced the dirt. He turns back to his motorcycle. He has spent most of its Promethean reaching the sea, and now he knows it was nothing but wasted fuel and time. But he drove through a small town where there were still people. Maybe the remaining Promethean will get him back there. The bike gutters to death half a mile away. He feels a lump in his throat and doesn't understand why he pats the handlebars one last time. As he turns and walks away, he resists the urge to look back. He won't be able to leave if he looks back. The outskirts of town are quiet. The suicidal are already gone. Some hang from lampposts. Stomachs swollen and leaking, they leave behind the mad and the spiteful. An ashen breeze carries the stench of a decomposing atmosphere of chemicals and digestive fluid. In the distance he can hear the thump of music, pulsing through the dying earth. It is as good a direction as any. He feels lightheaded. The ruin of his right arm oozes vitae and pus. He is dying. His blood races against the apocalypse, but for now he is alive. He hears the screaming of a child. He follows that awful sound to a side street, a street that stinks of refuse and rock gut and sick. He finds the girl there, in the grip of a man with graying hair and a lolling tongue. Hey ho, mate, the man says. His words are slurred, his eyes are unfocused. Wanna share? Wait! No! No, wait! The whip crack of the las pistol pitches him to the floor. The shot has pierced his chest and collapsed his lung. He gasps as it fills with sludging fluid, struggling for a breath that comes only in ragged, racking coughs. The soldier puts away his pistol, crouches down and offers the little girl his hand. Timidly, she reaches out and takes it. They leave the dying man where he lies. She reminds him of his daughter. Her shoulder-length hair is chestnut brown, and her dark eyes are wide and scared, like two sinkholes sucking all the horror into her soul. Her arms are covered in scratches and scrapes. They walk towards the sound of music, two lonely figures in empty streets. They ignore the graffiti and the blood and all those memory stains of madness that occupied the recent past. All those false theories and wild accusations, all those false revelations and pointless barters. They ignore the shadow of a woman hanging from the lamppost, her cheeks puffy from grief and death. The music leads them to a church. It is an incongruous match, gothic archways standing stiffly beside reverb bass and up-tempo beats. There are people dancing, drinking, laughing, crying. The little girl grips his hand tighter. Join us! A woman calls out. Dance with us! There is nothing left to do. He looks to the girl. His voice is gruff and bubbling from the scar tissue in his throat. Do you want to dance, little lady? She nods and leads him by the hand. There are three men and two women here, swaying and pounding feet between the pews. Graffiti stains the statuary and inscripted walls. One of the men offers him a drink. He brings it to his lips and fills the salve of lukewarm ale against his ravaged throat. It is like an ocean wave trickling over clacking rocks. The little girl places her tiny feet on his 
and giggles as he stumbles and sways. They dance until he collapses, her scream swallowed up by the bass and rising black. When he wakes, he is lying on a pew. A man sits beside him, tensing his arm as blood transfuses from the living to the dying. Welcome back, he says. I'm Mark. The soldier blinks. Don't try to get up, you've been bleeding out for days. Am I going to die? Mark smiles. We all are. The girl. She's safe. She's trying ale for the first and last time. She's just a child. It's the end of the world, friend. And not so potent a drink, more's the pity. How long have I been out? An hour. I need to stand. Give me three more hours, friend. It's slow without proper equipment. No, I can't. I... It's all right. Close your eyes. When did you last sleep? He closes his eyes. If not for the slowness of his dying thoughts, he would have kept them open. He sleeps a dreamless sleep, overtaken by blissful oblivion. For a few precious hours, he does not hear the sound of screaming or feel the agony of half-cooked flesh. But then he wakes and the pain returns. How long? He asks. You startled me, friend. How long? Long enough. Let me remove the tube and for the love of the god emperor, get up slowly. He feels a pinch in his arm, the press of a plaster to his skin. Mark helps him get upright, his head spinning with bloodless stupor. He looks around for the girl. He sees her tottering, giggly and drunk, spinning in the arms of a young-faced woman. She's fine, friend. As fine as she can be. He nods. Can we stay with you? He asks. Until the end. Of course. I need some air. Don't go far, friend. He makes his way from the church doors, breathing in the cold air of the encroaching dusk. As the sun sets, it is partly occluded by the black cloud swarms. Its light sicken to a rusted green as it diffuses through poison spores. Across the courtyard are steps, leading to the parapets of an ancient wall. Once the wall must have marked the edge of the settlement, but the town grew beyond it, expanding like vines from the stone and weathered bricks. He climbs those steps, feeling his world tremble with every hesitant step. He wants to see how long they have, how long they have before they come and bring the end of all things. He stares across the horizon into the face of an incoming storm. The black formations in the sky are not clouds and the sheets of grey are not rain. It is not weather racing towards them, but locusts of red tooth and bloody claw and poison spittle. By his estimation, they have five hours. He had fought them. He had tried to stop them, but only they could stop the tide of an ocean. The Xanark Tenth stretch across the horizon, rooted into trench networks that are months in the making. Tens of thousands of able-bodied men and women clutch at their las guns, their numbers bolstered by the Planetary Defense Force and almost a million volunteers. The defense lines are supported by bunkers and heavy weapon emplacements, forming zones of overlapping fire under the cannons of two dozen Lehman Russ battle tanks and scores of Chimera APC multi-lasers. 200 meters back, the Earthshaker cannons of basilisks glint dully in the morning sun. Here is a force that can bring entire worlds to heal. The hammer of the god emperor, arrayed in all its glory and might. It is not nearly enough. Fighting retreats across the northern hemisphere have bought the defenders time to build this speed bump. The Lord General has decided that this is where the war will be lost but he speaks of victory to his soldiers. They don't know yet. They don't know that the entire fleet has been devoured, that the astropaths have lost their minds, that the incoming swarm will drown out the light of the sun. The Earthshaker cannons fire and prove true their name. The soldier grimaces beneath his helmet, feeling the palpitations through the dirt. He can see the enemy, but only vaguely. A black smudge that reaches across the ridge and convulses like fitful smoke. 
By the time he can make out individual loping movements, the Lehman Rust tanks have opened fire, the percussive boom of battle cannons resembling the throaty roar of their namesake. Each shot sends hundreds of Xenos into pieces, separating chitin and claws and talons into bloody chunks of discarded putrid meat. But every crater scarred into the earth fills as if with water. It becomes clear just how many of them there are and what this battle is. He pisses himself and finds himself temporarily unable to think. The auto cannons open up. Thousands of Xenos have already been killed, their bodies crushed beneath the endless waves of bounding monsters. Last cannon bolts dance towards larger, more terrible creatures still, burning blackened holes in the chitin of impossible things. Gargoyle locusts thicken the sky, each the size of a grown man. The heavy bolters join the battle, blowing apart chitin into red powder. The soldier realizes that the sergeant is shouting at him. Corporal! Firing line! Weapons up! Training kicks in. He passes the order down the line, snapping the squad out of their reverie terrors. Laz guns lock into position, aimed at the coming swarm. Fire! Then, just sound and blinking sensations. Laz gun whip cracks, alien shrieks, screaming men and bellowing artillery, inhuman roars, murderous percussion, keening cries, snapping bones, metal shearing, muscles tearing, terror and bravery mixing into one churning brown paint of cacophonous emotion. Death on a scale not meant for human comprehension, in so short a time as to drive mortal minds insane. A microcosm of an uncaring, devouring galaxy that knows only war. And soon, agony too, as the green acid spits, and he brings up his right hand to save one half of his face. He wakes to the sound of buzzing and the sensation of burning. He finds a motorbike before the corpse feasters can reach him. He drives away and never looks back. He stumbles back into the church, collapsing onto a pew. He feels immeasurably tired. Part of him is tempted to sleep, but sleep is just another form of suicide now, and he left behind such notions when he saw the Eaton Sea. Above him is a fresco of the Emperor, a golden giant grappling with a winged serpent, his blade alight with whitened flame. The dragon is pierced by fire, broken body unraveling around the master's feet. It's the only thing that survived round here, probably because it's so high up. Mark sits beside him, offering another cup of weak ale. This place was looted early on, Mark continues, gesturing to the stripped altar and broken podium. Some fools must have thought that gold still mattered. The graffiti came afterwards, we think. When did you come here? This afternoon. We found some corpses here and buried them in the garden. Why? Mark shrugs. We didn't want them ruining the mood, he says, smiling. And we didn't want to toss them into the street. You came here to die. We came here to live. One last time. This is a good place to celebrate humanity. Mm. You're a soldier, aren't you, friend? One of the Xanark? Yes. He feels Mark squeeze his shoulder. Thank you for trying. I'm sorry it wasn't enough. Oh, don't be foolish, friend. Is your home still out there, then? Yes. That's something. And my wife and daughter. Mark smiles sadly. Well, he says, thank the Emperor they're not here. The little girl spots them and runs over, drunk and bleary-eyed. She throws herself into the soldier's chest, resting her pretty head upon his shoulder. He brings her into a clumsy embrace, disadvantaged by his missing hand. Her hair smells like ash and strawberries. For the first time in a week he smiles, stroking her hair as she softly slumbers. A few peaceful minutes pass, blaring music seeming to fade into autumnal black. You should know that she won't wake. Mark says. He holds up a placating hand. Don't, friend. It's for the best. 
A little girl shouldn't know what it feels like to be ripped apart limb from limb. The soldier stops fumbling for his last pistol. There is a deadness in his heart. Is it all poison then? He eventually asks. No. We can make an informed choice. The little one couldn't. I gave her all the anaesthetic I had left. You should have told me. Asked me. No, friend. I didn't want you to have to do that. The soldier feels the deadness in his heart dissolve in awful hate. He brings up his last pistol. He shoots Mark in the head, sending him slumping against the pew. When the women scream, he shoots them too. He pitches one over the wreckage of the pulpit and drops another with a clean round to the eye. A man has the time to roar in outrage before he dies, crashing through the punch table. The last man takes two rounds to the stomach and cracks open his skull against the stone floor. The soldier bows his head. His tears mingle with the ashen strawberry scent of her hair. He sits there for a few hours holding her. Then, he lets her corpse slip from his grip. Her frail body slumps against the cold stone. I'm sorry, Becca. Daddy loves you. He can hear them coming. It sounds like a thousand scratching quills pressing on the confines of his mind. The loud caster has fallen silent. He idly examines his empty las pistol, a wry smile on his lips. In a minute or two, he'll regret his actions. He's still not sure what it was. A massacre? An avenging? Mercy. If he had killed the last man with a single round, his charge pack wouldn't be empty. He grunts, tossing the gun away. The scuttling sound grows louder, broken by the voice-tearing screams of inhuman throats. There are a few gunshots. He gets to his feet. He almost falls. The bumpy scar tissue of his face is ashen grey. He staggers. He had wanted to climb the bell tower, but he knows he wouldn't make it. Instead, he stumbles outside. He ascends the dozen or so steps to the ancient inner wall. The Xenos spill among the streets like water between cracks, moving as one organism of many bodies, cavorting in perfect synchronization. Black, lifeless eyes seek out their prey, foul ichor dripping from extended toothy maws. Their talons and claws clack along the rockcrete, scratching at the surface. Scratching quills or clacking pebbles, smoothed out by dead ocean tides. He feels the slow churning of dread gather in his stomach. Despite it all, he is afraid. When they see him, they hiss, the air bubbling where their poison breath meets the sky. He readies himself. He raises his arms in a guard and squares off against the steps. He doesn't see his death coming. The Hormagaunt pounces, clearing the distance between street and parapet in one effortless leap. A pair of talons rip him into shredded pieces. He screams, but briefly. The swarm moves on. Soon the corpse feasters arrive, bodies bloated like blood-gorged ticks. They tear the flesh from his melting bones and lick up the bubbling marrow. They are thorough. They leave nothing to waste. When they are done, they move on to the church. Hours pass. The town is picked clean. There is no vegetation, no birds or insects or rodents. Certainly no humans. The corpse feasters continue. They reach the edge of the devoured ocean and make their clumsy, shuffling way down to where waves once lapped against the shore. They wriggle and crawl to one of the capillary towers, a huge, writhing edifice of pulsating muscle and tensing flesh. Around the tower is a great digestive pool of acrid sludge. The air shimmers in its stench. As one, the corpse feasters throw themselves into the acid pool, and what is left of him dissolves into stinking soup. <laughs>